through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, Lord and Jesus Christ, our God. Have mercy upon us and save us. I mean, glory to thee, O Lord, glory to thee. O Heavenly King, the comfort of the Spirit of Truth, who are everywhere present fill us all things. O treasure of a good and bestower of life, come and dwell in us and cleanse us from every stain and save our souls, O good one. Through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, Lord and Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy upon us and save us. I mean. Now we beseech you, brethren, <clears throat> with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together before him, in order that ye be not quickly shaken from your reason, nor to be stirred, neither by a spirit, nor by a word, nor by an epistle, as if by us, as if the day of Christ hath arrived. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day shall not come, unless the apostasy should come first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all which is called God, or an object of worship, so as for him to sit in the temple of God as God, showing himself that he is God. Do you not remember that when I was yet with you, I was telling you these things? And now ye know that which restraineth, in order that he be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawless, the lawlessness already is energizing itself, only there is the one who restraineth now, until he should come to be taken out of the midst. And then the lawless one shall be revealed, whom the Lord shall destroy by the breath of his mouth, and shall bring to naught by the manifestation of his coming, whose coming is according to the energy of Satan and all power and signs and lying wonders, and in all deceit of the unrighteousness in those who are perishing, because they received not the love of the truth, in order for them to be saved. And on this account, God shall send to them an influence of error for them to believe the lie, that they all might be judged who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in the unrighteousness. But we are bound to give thanks to God always concerning you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God chose you for himself from the beginning to salvation and sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth, to which he called you through our gospel to acquisition of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brethren, be standing firm and holding fast the traditions which ye were taught, whether by word or by our epistle. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God and Father the one who loved us and gave everlasting consolation and good hope by grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. So this is from St. Paul's second epistle to the Thessalonians, chapter 2. I read the whole chapter. And it doesn't just apply to the Thessalonians in those times. It applies to us today. So if I knew you were saying earlier, they were saying, you know, I don't want to hear these things or see these difficult things that are happening in the world today with the Pope going to Constantinople and all the lies and deception that we're hearing. Christ told us, you know, that my sheep hear my voice, right? And it's actually a great opportunity for us to better learn our faith, to practice our faith, to live our faith, to pray, and above all, to become in union and in communion with the only and true living God. So there's so much we could pull from this. And I just want to pull one small part, and I'll read it again. On this account, because of their deceptive ways, God shall send to them an influence of error for them to believe the lie. Right? So the ecumenists, the modernists, those with false intentions, false union, they actually believe what they're doing is the right thing. That's the sad part. It's delusion. Right? And it's obvious. When someone says to you, you know, uh, when Christ said, you know, a kingdom that is divided should not stand, and comparing that, that the church is divided? It's borderline blasphemy. The body of Christ is not divided. Yes, it is true that there are non-Orthodox Christians in other confessions outside of the church, and we pray for them to become and return 
to the only true bride of Christ, the Orthodox Church, but to suggest that the Church of God is divided and only by the unity of all are we following Christ's command that they shall be one as we are one. The first section of Scripture, the pericope, where it says a kingdom of God shall not be divided or a kingdom of its divided shall not stand. If you read in Scripture, the context is when Christ was falsely accused through the archdemon of demons to when he was pulling out demons. That's what, they, that's what the scribes and the Pharisees said to him. And that's when Christ said, you know, if Satan rebukes Satan, shall kingdom that's divided stand? It's ridiculous. It has nothing to do with about the unity of the church. And the second part, where it says, um, they all shall be one as we are one, is what our Lord prayed, that the apostles be one. We shall not be one with heresy. What do the scriptures say? What does, what does light have to do with darkness? Truth with falsehood. So let us not be deceived. Let us not lose hope. If anything, give glory to God that he deemed us worthy to live in these times to give a proper and holy witness to the truth. So tonight, um, what I thought we could discuss very briefly is the life uh, of St. Nicholas, who we celebrate this Saturday. But prior to doing that very briefly, just a, maybe a few sections, uh, returning to this book, Made Perfect in Faith by Father James Thornton, and I encourage you, uh, we've got to, don't have it here anymore. If, if we don't get it soon, I encourage you to get it. Because it goes through saints throughout history, right? Yeah, Made Perfect in Faith by Father James Thornton. And, and what, I, what I love about this book, amongst many things, that it gives a, a survey of different saints throughout of history, is give us understanding is, you know, what, who is a church father? Just because someone is ordained, whether it be patriarch, archbishop, metropolitan, bishop, priest, deacon, it's not magical. All of a sudden, you know, whatever they say is infallible. Right? It's ridiculous. Unless they actually are living the faith and rightly dividing the word of God's truth, no. <laughs> How many, you somewhat said it earlier tonight, you know, how often it was the clergy that are amongst the heretics, right? Areas from the first ecumenical synod that we're going to very quickly touch on, right? So it's very important when we read scripture or we hear people quoting scripture, right? Whether they be, they be Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons or any, anyone quoting scripture, according to the Holy Fathers, it's not what I think, or what you think, or what anyone thinks. It's according to the Holy Fathers. What do the Holy Fathers say on this section of Scripture, right? And that's why, glory to God, we have uh, Father Matthew and Father John you know, giving us the alternative uh, homilies from week to week. And Father John in particular giving us the, uh, the Sunday Gospels, and often according to St. John the Chrysostom, right? So that no one can, you know, question the authority of this great saint. So tonight, very briefly, I'm going to speak about, you know, the church fathers and a little bit about St. Nicholas. So hopefully we'll be able to get it all done. In the Orthodox Church, we often speak of the Holy Church Fathers. We quote their words in sermons, commentaries, essays, and books. We regard them as the preeminent interpreters of Holy Scripture. We study their lives. We celebrate their memories on their feast days throughout the year. We pray for their intercession before God. Their teaching and example set upon the foundation of the Holy Gospels form the structure of the Orthodox way of life in the Orthodox worldview. It's very important, that last part there. Orthodox worldview. How do we as Orthodox view the world? How do we Orthodox understand prayer, uh, common prayer? Right? To suggest that what happened on Sunday was not a common prayer is ridiculous, right? The Pope said the Lord's Prayer in the Orthodox liturgy. That's not common prayer? If that's not common prayer, what is? Please explain that to me according to the Holy Fathers. Not what you think. What I think and what you think means nothing. 
which the Holy Fathers say on this topic or that topic. Okay? Let's not have a perver perverted worldview. Let's not have a worldly worldview. In the realm of theology, the Holy Fathers rank first. Modern Orthodox theologians struggle to acquire the mind of the Fathers, that is, to acquire their way of thinking, ways of thinking that describe not only the intellectual processes, because we spoke about that, right? Orthodox is not just a cerebral process to read a bunch of books and quote stuff like a computer. It's good to read books. We're reading books, right? But much more significantly, patterns of thought that flow directly out of lives lived in sanctity. So why do they call them Holy Fathers? Other than the fact that they have the, the canonical ordination, right? It's because they're holy. Since the teachings of the Orthodox Church and the Orthodox way of life are found in the lives and works of the Church Fathers, our attempt is to explore the lives and teachings of some of these great men. Now, if the Holy Church Fathers loom so tremendously in the Orthodox Church, let us consider this question. What is a Church Father? Right? Can we call someone outside of the Church a Holy Father? During the earthly life of Jesus Christ, the Lord, as we know, established he established his church. Establishing her, he promised that he would always be with his church and that the church would be ever faithful in preserving the truth. Is the body of Christ divided, as we said earlier? It's ridiculous. The body of Christ is not divided. People freely leave the church. People freely reject the church. And glory to God, people freely return to the church. But the church is not divided. That is heresy, if not blasphemy. Establishing her, he promised that he would always be with his church and that the church would be ever faithful, preserving the truth. Christ God fulfills these promises in many ways. However, one of the most important ways he chooses to be with the church and maintain her always along the path of truth is to provide her in every age with holy men to guide her by their teachings. Thus, every age is an age of the Holy Fathers, because there's been a movement over the last several years about the post-patristic fathers, you know? We're done with these Holy Fathers. Oh, that was in those days, now we have to have new fathers, because we have new times. For those of you who came just recently, go back and read Second Thessalonians chapter 2, and you'll understand the context of everything. It's important. When we, when we hear things, we read things in context. Each of the Holy Fathers explained and taught the Orthodox faith, and most of them left behind a body of writing, a treasury of truth. And so we may begin by saying that a Holy Church Father is first a man who lives an exemplary life. By their fruits, you shall know them. Right? So we see the fruits of heresy, we see the fruits of false teachers, false prophets, and we see the fruits of the true teachers of the faith, right? Their exemplary life. He is holy in that he struggles to make his life conform totally to the will of God. Not what he thinks is the will of God, to the will of God. He is holy in that his earthly life, he lives a life in Christ completely and without exception. A man who lives a life that is less than a holy life cannot be of the Holy Church Fathers. Father George Ferofsky writes, Apart from the life in Christ, theology carries no conviction, and if separated from the life of the faith, that theology may easily degenerate into empty dialectics, a vain polyloia, right? idle talk, vain talk, without any spiritual consequence. The teaching of the fathers, Father Florosky goes on to say, was rooted in the decisive commitment to faith. Theology of this kind can never be separated from a life of prayer and from the practice of virtue. So an example, Father Metropolitan, the author of the is one of his books, I can't remember which one right now, says that in the early church times, and still exists to this day among some of the hierarchs, but back then especially, um, in order to be a candidate to the episcopacy, 
You had to be known by other holy people that were alive on the earth to have noetic prayer. You had to be at an accomplished spiritual level. Right? Thank you. Orthodox psychotherapy. Therapy of the soul. Because sometimes maybe the psychotherapy might have some other connotations in the English language. Right? So practice of virtue. The key to living a life in Christ is a life, living a life of asceticism, right? To become virtuous Christians, the Holy Fathers, like all of the saints, subdued the passions. So when they're speaking, they're not speaking out of passion. We say passion, pathos, right? They're speaking in the Holy Spirit, right? Because in such case, what happened, which are the downfall of most of us, and most Orthodox Christians. So when we do want to give responses to certain things and discussions with people, we need to really have, uh, as Christ says, don't you really know ourselves? What state am I in right now? Because if I'm not in a good state, I shouldn't be talking. And we know that from experience, right? Outside of the theological discussions, right? When you're not in a good mood, <laughs> don't talk. Because you know nine times out of ten what's going to come out of your mouth will not be, will not be anything that's beneficial, right? So the Holy Fathers, this they did by denying themselves. And in denying themselves, they broke the slavery of sin. That's what apathos is, right? Slavery to sin. And having done this, having cleansed themselves of the passions, they were granted mystical insight into the truths of God. Right? So theologian, right? By definition, one who sees God. How many theologians today are really God-seers? And it's not by chance that we have a few saints that are given the epithet so-and-so the theologian. You don't have tons of saints with that title. Right? It's a great honor. Some of the Holy Fathers were simple men, like many of the Holy Apostles, without or largely without worldly learning. Doesn't mean, so we don't misinterpret these things, that you don't go to school and learn and get a good education. We spoke a few weeks ago about St. John the Chrysostom. Right? But it's what we're learning and how we're learning is what's, what's important. So worldly, they did not have necessarily worldly learning. Some of the Holy Fathers were extremely learned men, the most learned men of their times, possessing the finest educations the world could offer. Yet, the mystical insight into the truths of God was the same for all these men, regardless of their learning. So we not, the Holy Fathers, you know, cannot consider them, you know, that they're holy and then have egotism, right? Or, you know, uh, you should be having a certain level of, you know, a PhD or two or three in order to speak to someone else. It's ridiculous. I'm not suggesting, again, not to have those. That's absurd. That's what God gives you. But it's how we use that kind of education. And in Greek, as we say, as long as your brains don't come out of your head, then you've got a good education. If your brains come out of your head, hyper-education, right? egotism, that's not an education at all. Some people who have read only the lives of the saints who were simple men and women, fools for Christ, for example, or some of the Desert Fathers, conclude that orthodoxy is, is exclusively a simple faith for simple people. Other people, in contrast, who have delved into the writings of, say, St. Gregory the Theologian, St. John Chrysostomos, or St. Gregory Palamas, reach the opposite conclusion that orthodoxy is exclusively a highly refined, highly cerebral faith. The truth is, that orthodoxy is neither exclusively one or the other, but is both. Because God, with man's synergism, right, sanctifies whatever state you are in. Meaning, if you're a person that's highly intellectual, and you're following the mystical, ascetical life of the church, then holiness happens. If you're a simple farmer, and you're following the ascetical, mystical life of the church, you become sanctified, right? True theology at bottom does not spring from intellectual speculation. Actually, heresy usually comes from intellectual speculation. But from purity of heart. What did Christ tell Judas? Open your mind. Open your heart. Right? It's the heart. Whatever comes out of the mouth comes from the heart. We are to purify our hearts. Hence the practice of the Jesus prayer, to purify the hearts. And thus teaches us Further, what Father Folovsky emphasized, that however simply or elegantly truth is expressed, for it to be of any consequence, it must be lived. Right? And that applies to us as well, right? 
Why should anyone listen to our orthodox dogma or anything within the orthodox faith if we ourselves are not living it? Metropolitan Nikolaus Chadzinikovlao of Mesoyer said that very recently in one of his homilies. Next, a church father is orthodox in his teaching. I know it sounds simple, of course. Well, unfortunately today it's not so obvious when we hear crazy things. He is of one mind with all of the Holy Fathers of his own age and of past ages. Cannot pick and choose. Oh, you know, that St. Cosmas guy, when he said to Papa Nakataras, curse the Pope, he's the reason for all of the, of the bad things that are happening. Oh, you know, that's ridiculous. Is it? Read the life of St. Cosmas in context, and, and you'll see why he said that. If purity and holiness are the foundation of true theology, then we can say easily understand why there is what Orthodox theolo theologians call a patristic consensus. That rather formidable term simply means that there is comprehensive agreement among all the Holy Fathers on matters of Orthodox teaching. Properly read and understood, the Holy Fathers do not contradict one another on any issue of significance. In the early days of the Church, St. Polycarp of Smyrna, St. Irenaeus of Lyon, St. Ignatius the God-bearer were of one mind. In the 4th century, St. Basil the Great, St. Gregory the Theologian, St. Gregory of Nyssa were of one mind. In the 20th century, St. John of San Francisco, St. Nicholas of Rochre and Zita, and Blessed Philaret of New York were of all one mind. All of these men were of one mind with the other Holy Fathers of their own age and with the Holy Fathers of previous and latter ages. Why? Because it is the same Holy Spirit. Right? The same Holy Spirit. This unity of mind is why we do not count men such as Tertullian and Origen to mention only two, as Holy Church Fathers. Their errors were of more of a substantial nat nature. Many of their teachings are sound and even highly valuable, but some of their teachings are also suspect or completely foreign to orthodoxy. To these men, we may grant the titles of Church Writer or Church Historian, but not, strictly speaking, Church Father. In the, in the, the time that we're looking at, God willing, we will talk of the lives, of the works of, of individual Holy Fathers. What can we gain from this? Why is it helpful to us as struggling Orthodox Christians? We are in the Church because we ultimately wish to please God and to achieve salvation of our souls. The lives and works of the Holy Church Fathers give us an understanding of God, of man, of the spiritual and material worlds, and of the relationship of all of these to one another. They teach us authentic Orthodox faith. They point the way for us. They show us precisely what God expects of us. To hear their words and observe closely the nature of their lives. And in doing this, we shall, in the words of St. Paul, acknowledge the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So it's very important, you know, that we go through this to, to lay a proper foundation. Right? Not just for tonight's talk, I'm going to briefly talk about St. Nicholas, not very much, something of, you know, of substance there, to understand. When we talk about Holy Fathers, what's the importance, what's the significance? Right? But for all times, when you're hearing anything from anyone speaking, myself included, I'm not infallible. Otherwise, I would be wearing a funny hat right now. Right? To be critical thinkers. right? Not, not to be questioning everyone because out of question's sake, but something that doesn't make any sense. Ask the question. Go back and ask the Holy Fathers. Go back and ask your, your spiritual father. Right? According to the Holy Fathers on this or that topic. So because unworthily I have the name of St. Nicholas... And I don't have any baklava to give you tonight. Unfortunately, it's a fasting day. Come by my house sometime to find me. Uh, 
I thought to offer you tonight the life of St. Nicholas very briefly, uh, because it's impossible uh, in, in one night to talk about St. Nicholas. So this is what I offer you tonight. Hopefully it's beneficial. St. Nicholas, the wonder worker, Archbishop of Mira and Lycia, is famed as a great and holy father of the church whose life was pleasing unto God. He was born in the city of Patara in the region of Lycia on the south coast of the Asian Minor Peninsula and was the only son of pious parents, Theophanes and Nonna, who had vowed to dedicate him, their son, to God. As the fruit of, of prayer of the, uh, his childless parents, the infant Nicholas from the very day of his birth revealed to people the light of his future glory as a wonder worker. His mother, Nonna, after giving birth, was immediately healed from illness. The newborn infant, while still in the baptismal font, stood on his feet three hours without support from anyone, thereby honoring the most holy trinity. St. Nicholas from his infancy began a life of fasting, and on Wednesdays and Fridays he would not accept milk from his mother until after his parents had finished their evening prayers. It may sound crazy to us, but... Yeah, for you and I, because we're not like his parents. <laughs> like the parents of the Panagia, Joachim and Nana, right? holy, holy people. But this is the example we should be trying to struggle to follow. Those who are our parents or future parents, or wannabe parents, in the good sense of wannabe. So things we should seriously consider. From his childhood, Nicholas thrived in the study of divine scripture. By day, he would not leave church, and by night, he prayed and read books, making himself a worthy dwelling place for the Holy Spirit. That's the purpose of education, right? Whatever you study, whatever you read, to help you become a dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. Right? That's our calling, every single one of us. Bishop Nicholas of Patara, this is the, the, the previous to him, rejoiced at the spiritual success and deep piety of his nephew. He ordained him a reader and then elevated Nicholas to the priesthood, making him his assistant and entrusting him to instruct the flock. The words of the bishop that Nicholas would become a comfort to the grieving, a good shepherd who would return to the flock those who had lost their way and save many souls in danger, would later prove to be prescient. In serving the Lord, the young Nicholas was fervent of spirit, and his proficiency with questions of faith, was he was like an elder, who aroused the wonder and deep respect of believers. Constantly at work and vivacious in unceasing prayer, the priest Nicholas displayed great kind-heartedness towards the flock and towards the afflicted who came to him for help, and he distributed all his inheritance to the poor. There was a certain formerly rich inhabitant of Patara whom St. Nicholas saved from a great sin. The man had three grown daughters, and in desperation he planned to sell their bodies so they would have money for food. The saint, learning of the man's poverty and of his wicked intention, secretly visited him one night and threw a sack of gold through the window. Hence the whole tradition of Santa Claus and down this, down the chimney, and down here and down there, right? A good comparison of St. Nicholas, look at his icon, right? The true St. Santa Claus, and compared to the one of Coca-Cola or others today. Right? See a big difference. With the money, the man arranged an honorable marriage for his daughter. St. Nicholas also provided gold for the other daughters, thereby saving the family from falling into spiritual destruction. In bestowing charity, St. Nicholas always strove to do this secretly, and to conceal his good deeds, right? Let the left hand not do, not know what the right hand is doing. The bishop of Patara decided to go on pilgrimage to the holy places in Jerusalem and entrusted the guidance of his flock to St. Nicholas, who fulfilled this obedience carefully and with love. When the bishop returned, Nicholas asked for his blessing to go on pilgrimage to the Holy Land as well. Along the way, the saint predicted that a storm would arise and threaten the ship. St. Nicholas saw the devil get on the ship, intending to sink it and all of the passengers. At the entreaty of the despairing pilgrims, he calmed the waves of sea by his prayers. So we may, may not be able to do that uh, at that level, but we can calm the waves within ourselves, right? Certain disturbances, whether they be externally or internally, through prayer. Through his prayer, a certain sailor of the ship 
who had fallen from the mast and was mortally injured, was also restored to health. When he reached the ancient city of Jerusalem and came to Golgotha, St. Nicholas gave thanks to the Savior. He went to all the holy places, worshipping at each one. And I encourage you to do the same. Very, very blessed. You, know, you think about where you to go for your summer vacation? To go to the Holy Lands and to go where the Lord literally wants. One night on Mount Sion, the closed doors of the church opened by themselves for the great pilgrim. Going round the holy places connected with the earthly service of the Son of God, St. Nicholas decided to withdraw to the desert. But he was stopped by a divine voice urging him to return to his native country. So for us as well, you know, we need to be seeking what is God's will. Sometimes we don't know necessarily. So through prayer and fasting and seeking guidance, we make a decision. God willing. And if God shows us another path, may be blessed. Right? We're not seeking to do our own will. We're doing, seeking to do the will of God. So this is what St. Nicholas did. And he returned to Lycia, and yearning for a life of quietude, the saint entered into the brotherhood of a monastery named Holy Sion, which he had been found by his uncle. But the Lord again indicated a, 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 another path for him. Nicholas, this is not the vineyard where you shall bear fruit for me. Return to the world and glorify my name there. So he left Patara and went to Mira in Lycia. Upon the death of the Archbishop of Mira, John, Nicholas was chosen to replace him as after one of the bishops of the council said that a new Archbishop should be revealed by God. See this, this whole concept, right? Revealed. Okay. That's how the next bishops are here in North America. They will be revealed by God. Okay. We need to be patient, all of us. Not chosen by men. One of the elder bishops had a vision of radiant man who told him that the one who came to the church that night and was first to enter should be made archbishop. He would be named Nicholas. The bishop went to the church at night to await Nicholas. The saint always, the first to arrive at church, is a good reason why he wanted to go to church first, was stopped by the bishop. What is your name, child? He asked. God's chosen one replied, My name is Nicholas Despota, and I am your servant. It's actually on a side topic. A friend of mine was uh, seeking a wife, and he couldn't find a wife. And his brother, his brother said to him, "Okay, here's what you're going to do: you're going to go to church early, and the first girl that walks in, that's who you're going to marry." And I had a little, a little disclaimer. I said, "Yes, without her mom." <laughs> After his ordination, he increased the austerity of his spiritual struggles with fasts, vigils, and prayers continuing to excel at the monastic life. Because again, bishops are monastics, right? Not just a celibate priest, right? But a real monastic, right? an accomplished monastic. After the death of his parents, he used his large inheritance to support those in need by giving alms in secret. Because of his virtues, God granted him the grace to work miracles. St. Nicholas remained a great ascetic, appearing to his flock as an image of gentleness, kindness, and love for people. This was particularly precarious for the Lucinian church during the persecution of Christians under Emperor Diocletian. His efforts to spread the faith led to his arrest by the pagan authorities who subjected him to torture and imprisoned him together with other Christians. So we see the example of the Good Shepherd. He did not shy away because of the fears of the world. As Christ says, the good shepherd lies, lays down his life for his flock. So Bishop Nicholas, locked up in prison together with other Christians for refusing to worship idols, sustained them and exhorted them to endure the fetters, punishment, and torture. The Lord preserved him unharmed. When Constantine the Great became emperor and stopped the persecutions, Nicholas was freed from these bonds and returned to his flock. He was a martyr by disposition, right? Though he didn't shed his blood, that was a martyrdom that he went through. And we the same in these times, right? Where there be martyrdom within the church, with ecumenism, and not right teaching hierarchs and priests. Again, not all, it's absurd. But some, unfortunately, that's a form of, of, of a martyrdom. Or within the world, right? To living an upright, orthodox and Christian life. It's a double martyrdom. It's a double crown. It's a blessing. 
even though his blood was not actually shed. St. Nicholas was restored to his flock, which joyfully received their guide and intercessor. Despite his great gentleness of spirit and purity of heart, St. Nicholas was a zealous and ardent warrior of the Church of Christ. Fighting evil spirits, the saint made the rounds of the pagan temples and shrines in the city of Mira and its surroundings, shattering the idols and turning the temples to dust. In the year 325, St. Nicholas was a participant in the First Ecumenical Synod, which was convoked by St. Constantine of Nicaea and Vithynia to deal with the Arian heresy. This council proclaimed the Nicaean symbol of faith, and he stood up against the heresies with the likes of St. Sylvester, Bishop of Rome, St. Alexander of Alexandria, St. Spiridon of Trimuthundus, and other holy fathers of the Great Council. According to holy tradition, St. Nicholas, who was a model of faith, right? Canona pisteos, and an image of gentleness, keikona praotitos, was seized with holy zeal and unable to bear the blasphemous words of Arius, slapped him on the face. Well, what happened today, St. Nicholas? People would revile you and burden you with the names such as Rufian and trample upon human rights and fanatic and goodness knows what else. But God does not see as we do. He sees the motives behind the actions. St. Nicholas did not strike Arius out of hatred, but in order to rebuke him and bring him out of his error. God alone knows the motives for actions. People see only the actions. So again, for ourselves, question our motives. Why are we doing what we're doing? Let us be watchful. So we're not doing things out of pathos, out of passion. This action on the part of St. Nicholas provoked an immediate reaction on the part of Constantine who was present, and he ordered the forces of law to order uh, in order to seize the saint and remove the emblems of his episcopal rank and to take him to prison and chains to be placed under guard. But several of the Holy Fathers had the same vision seeing the Lord himself and the Mother of God returning to him the gospel in the Omophorium, which the bishop wears. The next morning, some of his acquaintances found him free of his chains, wearing his stole and reading the gospel. The emperor learned of this, immediately begged his forgiveness and had him released. The fathers of the council agreed that the audacity of the saint was pleasing to God and restored him to the office of bishop. Having returned to his own diocese, the saint brought brought it peace and blessings, sowing the word of truth, uprooting heresy, nourishing his flock with sound doctrine, and also providing food for their bodies. Even during his life, St. Nicholas worked many miracles. One of the greatest was the deliverance from death of three men unjustly condemned by the governor who had been bribed. The saint boldly went up to the executioner and took his sword, already suspended over the heads of the condemned. The governor, denounced by St. Nicholas for his wrongdoing, repented and begged for forgiveness. And that's why at times hierarchs, real hierarchs at times, will speak out to the government if they're doing things that are against the church. St. John the Christensen, yes, says that we are to be obedient to the authorities, as scriptures say, with one exception, when it tramples upon piety. So if the state or anyone tells us, and I tell my kids this, the only time you're going to be disobedient to Maman Baba is if Maman Baba says something that's against Christ, against the church, then don't listen to me. Right? There's a holy disobedience. Right? When it's against the church. Witnessing this remarkable event were the three military officers who went, who were sent to Phrygia by the Emperor Constantine to put down a rebellion. They did not suspect that soon they would also be compelled to seek the intercession of St. Nicholas. Evil men slandered them before the emperor, and the officers were sentenced to death. Appearing to St. Constantine in a dream, St. Nicholas called on him to overturn the unjust sentence of the military officers. So again, St. Nicholas worked many miracles and struggled many years, long years, at his labor. With the prayers of the saint, the city of Mira was rescued from a terrible famine. He appeared to a certain Italian merchant and left him three gold pieces as a pledge of payment. He requested him to sail to Mira and deliver grain there. More than once the saint saved those drowning in the sea. He provided release from captivity and imprisonment. 
As long as he lived and even after his death, St. Nicholas, Nicholas miraculously saved a great many people who were traveling by sea, as well as the crews of the ships they were, that were sailing in, and he has thus come to be regarded as their protector. As his biographer Simeon writes, his fame took wings, soared, went everywhere and embraced all things. It crossed the blue deep, traveled all over the seas, and there was no place where people did not hear of his wondrous interventions. Another well-known incident is that of the person who fell overboard and was saved as soon as he showed it. St. Nicholas, help me. He suddenly found himself at home with his kin and his wife, even though his clothes were still dripping wet with seawater. <laughs> this may sound crazy to us, right? The intercessions of the saints. Another time, sailors in danger of sinking called upon St. Nicholas, and he appeared and said to them, you called, and I came. He took over the rudder and commanded the sea to be calm. I actually remember a story from a Yaya, who had uh, St. Nicholas as the patron saint of her home. And thieves came in and stole everything. She was a poor woman. And she went to the icon of St. Nicholas and said, Eh? You see? What are you doing there? So she took the icon of St. Nicholas and put it outside. And said, Until they come back and bring my stuff, exo. And what happened? Shortly afterwards, the thieves came back and brought her all their stuff. Right? True piety. Right? Where did she read that? In a book somewhere? When St. Nicholas had reached a great age, he peacefully fell asleep in the Lord. His venerable relics were preserved and corrupt in the local cathedral church of Mira, which was built in his honor. Until the 11th century, his grave produced holy myrrh, which cured all manner of sickness, from which many received healing. In 1087, the soldiers of the First Crusade took his relics to the Italian city of Bari, where they rest even now. The name of the great saint of God, the hierarch and wonder worker Nicholas, a speedy helper and suppliant for all hastening to him, is famed in every corner of the earth, in many lands and among many peoples, in Greece and Russia and Serbia, throughout the world, there are a multitude of cathedrals, monasteries, and churches consecrated in his name. There is perhaps not a single city without a church dedicated to him. Today in Greece, there is not a barren rock, island, island, coastal site, or even a place further from the sea which does not have an iconostasio, chapel, parish church, or monastery church in honor of St. Nicholas. Besides the Greek navies, both military and the merchant, have the Bishop of Mira in Lycia as their patron saint, and depictions of him fill the bridges of the ships, the cabins of the sailors and the houses of their relatives with his presence and grace. Because the saint preserves from dire straits and bitter death those who run to him. St. Nicholas is, honorly, is honored particularly in the Holy Monastery of Atopedi, both within the monastery and his dependency of Porto Lagos, which is dedicated to the saint. The church and all the buildings of the dependency have been renovated. There is a healthy presence of monks from the monastery, so the daily services are read, as also are canons of supplication both to St. Nicholas and in the chapel of Mother of God, the Queen of All. Many people from the neighboring region, as well as from the rest of Greece abroad, find relief and comfort there. The main churches of the monasteries of Uriguria and Nikita on the Holy Mountain are also dedicated to him. St. Nicholas, who was a great intercessor while alive, having left the earth, still lives to intercede for all who seek his refuge. By his holy prayers, may God have mercy upon us and save us. Amen. So I'm going to stop right there. If there's any questions or comments on any of the three things that we read tonight, I'm uh, willing to entertain your questions. In your, the first section that you read, you mentioned um, something about uh, St. Cosmas. I was just wondering, his prophecies, can they change if the people change? Or did he make those prophecies knowing that the people wouldn't change? Well, you know, it's a good question, actually. In general, in general, there are a lot of prophecies that actually say, if the people do repent, this will happen. If they don't repent, this will happen, right? So some of his prophecies actually do speak like that, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Because, again... It's not like it's, we don't understand, Elder Paisius, the Holy Mountain says, you know, we don't necessarily understand the prophecies until they actually happen. 
And they're like, ah, when it's fulfilled, then they're understood, right? So it's difficult because of our spiritual state to, when we read certain things to fully understand them. And that's why we go back to the church fathers. We go back and ask our spiritual father. We ask the church, you know, how do we properly interpret this or that? Hi, Nico. Thank you for your talk. Thank you. Um, you mentioned how we're supposed to be um, uh, kind of following and being like, um, what is it called? Um, you know, following orders. Unless, of course, it's going against Jesus' teachings. Correct. So say somebody works for someone and they're doing something unethical and they know about it. What are they supposed to do yeah. if they're worried about losing their job and not being able to provide for their family? It's very tough. Very, very, very tough. Yeah. That's what definitely, you know, spiritual father question. You know what I mean? Um, one thing I could suggest is to pray. Right? So, Lord, show me. What should I do? Right? Go seek guidance with your spiritual father. Yeah, workplace is very difficult, right? Because uh, because our faith is weak. And when I say our faith, mine included, you know, we, we get afraid sometimes. You know, what, am, what am I going to say? Sometimes the devil sets up ambushes for us too, right? That we say things either the wrong way or the wrong time. So that's why it's imperative. Go back to your spiritual father. One example I can give you, a friend of mine who was working in a Greek restaurant, unfortunately, and I'll say I'll explain to you why. So he goes to me one day, goes, Nico, thank God, you know, the in the, in the restaurant, you know, no one's blaspheming. Christos Tomasu, <laughs> don't say anything. The next day, oh, what happened? Oh, the owner of the business is blaspheming the Panagia. What did you do? Because I ran like a chicken with my head cut off, saying, what am I going to do? If I don't say something, I'll take my cross off. I'm not a Christian anymore. I gotta say something. What am I gonna say? Panagia, help me. So he goes, what did, like, well, what did you do? I went to the cook. Yani, let me ask you a question. If somebody told your mother off, what would you what would you do? Tipas? I'd kill him. Well, what if he didn't mean to say it? Still, doesn't matter. The Maramo. Well, what about the Panagia? Does she not count? So he went to the owner, because it wasn't the cook that blasphemed, it was the owner. So he went to the owner. He knows, you know, uh, Kiru Vasili, you know, Kamefora, sometimes we, you know, when we're, when we're mad or we get upset, you know, sometimes we say things, not nice words, and, you know, sometimes uh, blaspheming the Panagia, and he goes, you know, earlier today, you know, you said that. You know? And he said it in such a nice and humble way. You know what the owner said? Toi paf toi go. I said that. He didn't realize it. And he said from that day, he never did it again. So that's why when we go to correct, right, which we can at times, we can be careful. What's our, we said earlier, what's our intention? What's our motivation? And what state are we in, right? But I honestly believe that if we do things with a, a holy fear, like a proper way, with love and true compassion, nine times out of ten, the words will come up properly, right? How the other person takes it? Depends on their disposition. But let us at least say things the right way. Right? A good thing ain't good if it ain't done the good way. Right? So we try. And it's good. We're all struggling. Right? But let's be mindful of that. You know, at least, okay, I want to make this correction here because this is very wrong. How am I going to do it? Right? Sometimes it's good to meet with a few people, you know, and get the frustration out. <laughs> a very good friend of mine said to me, you know what you do? You write a letter and then you tear it up. Or email it to yourself. Right? So you get all that frustration out first. Right? And then through prayer, through fasting, through guidance, and then whatever God enlightens us to do. It's more so in the how. Not necessarily what we do. It's more so in the how. Right? Because sometimes it could be a situation where maybe God wants that person to go somewhere else. Find a job somewhere else. But maybe they're too attached to that job. So God changes some of the circumstances to get that person to go somewhere else. Or, like I said earlier, maybe to make a correction or something. I will hope that helps, right? I hope that helps. Now, those are difficult, very, very difficult. Thank you for your question. Pass it back there. Um, 
there's these two Polish people I know, uh, the Roman Catholic, and we were talking about uh, giving gifts on Christmas. And uh, they mentioned, um, I was surprised, the day we celebrate St. Nicholas, uh, that's the day in Poland where they give gifts to the children. <laughs> nice. They don't give gifts on Christmas. Nice. So uh, I was really surprised about that. And they're not nice. Orthodox, Roman Catholic, yeah. and they, they do they do give gifts on well, at one point, the Polish were Orthodox, right? So they kept that very good tradition. And that's one thing I love about Pan-Orthodoxy, right? That we look at the different traditions from the different the different backgrounds, wherever they may be, and it's beautiful, right? The Serbs, for example, they don't have their own Saints' Day. They have a Slava, the whole family. So a lot of humility there. You know, we Greeks, oh, you're Tazo. Oh, you're ta what? You're the saint. It's your Saints' Day, right? So... We could take these good examples, you know, from all the different Orthodox, you know, he traditions. Said, he said, uh, they don't go to church on that day, so I don't know what that yeah, is. Yeah, well, that's the... <laughs> yeah. And he said, no, we just give gifts to the children. Yeah, that's what happens over time, about being separated from the church. You know, sometimes we keep some of the externals, but the internals, right? I actually had a similar question. I read on orthodox uh wiki or whatever it's called yeah. that saint nicholas was actually known for giving his gifts on december 6th so i guess i'm piggybacking on his question um in in modern times santa claus represents jolly old saint nick saint nicholas right so how misrepresents it, but yes so how did it end <laughs> up that the the gift giving on december 6th actually turned into the gift giving on the 20th you know what i'll go a little bit further we have to be very careful that we give gifts, how we give gifts, why we give gifts, to whom we give gifts, right? And it's not just on Christmas. Like the idea that the, the poor people are just on Christmas, you know what I mean? They get that turkey on Christmas. Okay, see you next year. My, my conscience feels better now. I did my good deed for the day. I don't even know where that's written, by the way, good deed for the day, right? It's in the how we do things and the why we do things, right? We should be giving gifts on a regular basis, right? And we should be giving to those in need. Are we in need? I'm not saying never give a gift. Let's not go to extremes with things. Let's, let's be mindful, right? The ways of the world, this Black Friday, this craziness. You know, someone posted something that made me laugh. You know, said the day before the Americans were thinking, celebrating Thanksgiving, the next day they were running all over people for all the things they didn't have. Craziness. Yeah. You know? What we said earlier, our, our worldview, the way we view the world should be shaped according to Christ. Again, I'm not suggesting don't buy a gift from your family somewhere, but let's be mindful of those things, right? And I know a story a long time ago, a very good friend of mine, uh, three daughters uh, of a Russian priest. She actually said it to her father one day. You know, she was Papa. You know, Christ is better to give than to receive. Why are we giving... To ourselves, we don't need anything, and that changed the whole family. And they, on Christmas, they still gave gifts, a little thing here and there, a little sock, whatever, you know. But they found people that were in need, right? No extremes. And orthodoxy is far away from all extremes, right? And the kind of gifts that we give, right? You know, a, a gift that you might not think about giving. The names. To the priest, you know, during this forty-day fast, you know, and even during the forty fast of the of, the, of Pascha, you know, the names, give the names yeah, of the Orthodox people, yeah, even non-Orthodox, just make a section. Say, These are non-Orthodox, and they can do private prayer for them, right? Because many miracles happen, right? Those are kind of gifts, and those are the those are actually the more blessed gifts because no one knows right, that you did that. Right? There is great need of, 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 of gifts today and the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of prayer, the gifts of healing, the gifts of people going to Holy Confession. Right? People that have, as we say, you know, one foot in their tomb and they haven't gone for confession ever or since they were a young child. Those are the gifts, you know, that we should be praying for. So I hope that helps. <laughs> I love that.
So don't leave saying, Nico said don't give gifts at Christmas. Bad. Not suggested that. <laughs> you know, considering gifts, you know, a spiritual gift to give somebody, a book, a homily, you know what I mean? A ride to a monastery for confession, take him to church, an old lady. You know, I mean, there's these subtle things that we can do. Good evening, please. Yes, in your second homily, you mentioned really briefly um, Origen. Yeah. Um, and how he's not a church father. Um, but some theologians consider him to be, you know, a, a great contributor to our faith. Um, what do you know about him? Because I was trying to search some information about him, and it's not really clear how he apostatized. Yeah, him. yeah. Unfortunately, unfortunately, uh, Origen was contemplating upon God's love and how forgiving and merciful he is. And then it came about this, this uh, it's a heresy. That at some time, because God is so loving, He's so merciful, He's forgiving, that even you know, even the devil one day will repent, and everything's gonna be nice, and everyone's gonna be saved. Everyone's gonna... sounds nice. It's a nice happy story. But the truth is, unfortunately, when I say unfortunately, I mean the truth is the truth. That Christ says that Hades was created for the devil and his angels, right? And the angels aren't just the fallen demons. The angels are those who do the will of Satan, right? Conversely, those who are in heaven are as of angels. As Christ himself says that, right? Where there's no marriage in heaven, right? So, that's where he went off, right? That's why we have to be very careful and discerning that we don't, you know, our thoughts don't go outside of the realm of the church, Right? What is the church's teaching? Not just teaching. It's like, what, teaching, dogma? What's the church experience? Right? Do we have other holy fathers that agree with Origen on that topic? Absolutely not. Right? So it's very sad. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's most unfortunate. You know what I mean? But that just shows you with intellect, be careful. You know, if God gave you a brain, as we say, right? He gave you an intellect. Use it properly. Right? Every single one of us has a gift. Every single human being. You may wonder sometimes, oh, that person has a gift. <laughs> but everyone has a gift from God, right? God loves everyone the same, right? It's our love towards Him where the difference is. So, to use our intellect properly, if that's what God gives us, whatever He's given us, to use properly for His glory and to the service of our fellow man. As they say, I think it was uh, St. Porfirios that said, you know, love God and do whatever you want. <laughs> right? Love God and do whatever you want. So, that's what it's written. So, that's Thank it's you. Oh, okay. Sure, sure. Um, if a priest gets defrocked, can you ever become a priest again? Yeah, once once uh, that happens, unfortunately, and that's why it's very important that you know when a person's checking their calling, if they are called in the priesthood. <clears throat> that's where we were talking about earlier. Saint Nicholas, you know, was revealed, he wasn't called by men, right? Because we can we can have uh, you know very good intentions, and I hate using that cliche that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. But to go back and seek guidance and ask, right, and get some clarification. It's hard sometimes, right? I'm not saying these are easy things, right? But we need to struggle, you know, struggle with ourself, you know, battle within ourselves. You know, is this pleasing to God? That's how we should look at everything. But our minds aren't formed that way, you know. Our worldview, our thought processes are, are a little bit skewed at times. And everything we do, is this pleasing to God? To everything that we do, the way we walk, the way we talk, the way we eat, like everything. We don't think about that. Right? The way we dress, everything should be reflecting Christian piety. Right? 
let's not over go on the externals. The externals are important. We want to work on the inside of the cup as well. It's most important. Before we end, I'm just going to read the two hymns uh, we'll hear on church on Saturday. The truth of things have revealed thee to thy flock as a rule of faith, as an icon of meekness, and a teacher of temperance. For this cause thou hast achieved the heights by humility, riches by poverty. O Father and Hierarch Nicholas, intercede with Christ God, that our souls be saved. Thou, O righteous Nicholas in Mira, truly was shown forth as a sacred minister, fulfilling Christ's holy gospel. For thou didst lay down thy life for thy flock and people. And, O saint, didst save the innocent from unjust death. Wherefore thou wast sanctified as a great initiate of the divine grace of God. So we should end with a brief prayer. And uh, may St. Nicholas be with you and your families. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, both now and ever, to the ages of ages. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. O Christ, the true light, who dost enlighten and sanctify every man that cometh into the world, let the light of thy countenance be signed upon us, that in it we may behold the unapproachable light. Guide our steps to the performance of thy commandments by the intercessions of thine all immaculate mother and of all the saints on me. Through the prayers of our holy fathers, Lord and Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy upon us and save us. Amen. Have a good night. Thank you for coming.